Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll call the June 9th meeting of the Board of Directors of SAC Metro to order. Director Jones, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Jones. The Metro Cable announcement, the open session meeting is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14. Replay on Saturday, June 11th, 2016 at 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. and Sunday, June 12th, 2016 at 12 noon on Channel 14. Webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. The open session meetings are also available for viewing on the district website at dub.metrofire.ca.gov. Madam Clerk, do we have a speaker? We do have a speaker this evening, Mr. Stephen Williams, if you'd please join us at the podium. Hello, Mr. Williams. My name is Stephen Williams, and I'm a resident of Carmichael for now for 16 years. Um, my significant other, who I've been together with for over 20 years, unfortunately has uh, multiple sclerosis, and she would otherwise be here, but cannot because of the difficulties. But um, on June the 2nd, I made a call to Metro station, I believe it's Fire District Station 102, um, and I asked for assistance, lift assistance, because um, my significant other is now wheelchair bound, and there, at times there are difficulties with her transferring from the, from the um, vehicle that we were in into the house, and she got, it was one of those days when it was over 100 degrees. If those of you who know anything about multiple sclerosis, it is exacerbated by the heat. And at that day, for, um, for uh, um, Metro emergency crew members came out and, and helped to assist her to get into the house. One of the uh, gentlemen that was in that group um, proceeded to lecture me because he said he had been out there five times. And um, he wanted to know what we were intending to do with uh, making this a, a situation where he wouldn't have to come out there five times, or a sixth time, um, was what he was implying. Um, I found that to be offensive. At the time, I was very um, uh, kind of shocked because that was not the message that we had received and that had inquired about just that, if there's some limit on the number of times that we could ask for uh, lift assistance or something like that. Um, you know, but evidently, there are records that are kept, which are fine for keeping records, but um, if I need this service, I expect the service. So I put a call in after they had left and um, called uh, and was connected with Battalion Chief Castros, who was very responsive and you know spoke to me at length about this. He said that he was going to get back with me, and and uh, he, but unfortunately we did not connect. So I am here tonight just to make sure that you understand that there are some people that don't understand what your policies are as far as lift assistance. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see this to be a problem other places. As a matter of fact, two days later, um, my significant other had to go to a uh, funeral service where she was interring her um, parents into a grave. And needed a lift assistance, and this was in another county. This was in El Dorado or Nevada, I'm not sure exactly what. They not only came out, 
they gave her some equipment that would help her to do, you know, a lift assistance that would allow me to do. I, I wasn't in attendance at that time. But, you know, these are the kinds of things that I am expecting. And the thing that was most difficult about the charges that this person was making, well, what are you intending to do about this? We've been out of here five times now and this and that and this and that. You know, most or a lot of the funding that was available, because we tried to comply with funding that would allow her to have a ramp installed and have um, assistance to, to get this situation mitigated, um, it, it, th that funding had dried up. Every time we went through, and this has been very m much more um, uh, frustrating for us to navigate through all of that and to go through all of that and then to have him to come and say those things. But anyway, I just wanted to know, uh, uh, is there any l limit on the number of times that you can call for lift assistance? Well, might have started. Sir, thank you very much. I, I'm Mark Wells, the fire chief. And I, I want to thank you first for being here and addressing the group. We do appreciate your feedback and, um, and have concern um, with you into a long-term solution in terms of what's viable. So tonight, too, before um, and immediately after this, I would assume our entire command staff is here in the front, um, including our deputy chief of ops and our assistant chief in charge of the EMS division. So we're going to sit down and have a chat with you. I apologize for anything that has um, not met your expectation of Metro Fire. Um, the reality of uh, what we provide is we're in the helping people business. Um, we call ourselves a fire department, but it, literally we go to fires, but we go to a lot of things. Yes. And so we just try to make situations that aren't, aren't good better. I mean, it's that simple. So, and each case is different. So tonight, um, if you would please take me up on it, I'd like to introduce you to Chief Bridge and to Chief, Chief Johnson, where we can um, talk about your specific issue and then um, move forward in an amiable solution that is one, sustainable for you and your family so that you don't have a negative experience with the Metro Fire. Educate us on opportunities where you feel that we could improve because we want to hear that. And also, um, you know, get to something that is um, functional for you and your family. So that's what I'd like to do to this evening. I, I, I want to um, state for the record that at no time prior to this last experience, had I had any yeah. any um, negative things to report yeah. about the service that was provided, I, you know, it, it was a, a, a bad day. The hot temperature was very hot. Um, my wife or my significant other did not fall. However, she was stuck because we have we have a few steps to make it into the house and she couldn't go any further. And, and her weight was beyond my capacity for being able to lift. That's why I called. Okay. And rather, rather than take a risk, injure her, injure myself, and then, you know, then have to call. No, I understood, and, uh, and I appreciate, um, literally, I do really appreciate you coming out tonight and, uh, and addressing it with us. And, um, you know, of course, you know, Metro Fire's personnel do step up every day in the community, and uh, I couldn't be more proud to lead them in this. So I would like to say that um, let's get to a, a common understanding of what we can do working together and find out what the facts and the circumstances are, and, um, and Chief Johnson and Chief Bridge will work on that, and I do really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams, let me add on behalf of the board, we do appreciate your coming before us. You know, part of this is, is an education process for us, and we okay. learn from the input from our community. As Chief Wells says, Metro has a wonderful tradition of serving our public, and yes. part of that learning process is enhancing our service. So thank you very much, and please take the time to meet with Chief Johnson and Chief Bridge. It, it just leave. may simply be a, a, uh, an instructional um, you know, talk with this person that, you know, I couldn't provide any, any definite, um, because he'd say, well, what does he look like? And, you know, uh, no, I don't recall really. He was in uniform and that's all I could say. And I wouldn't want to, you know, indicate the wrong person, but, you know, I, I've never had any problems 
with any assistance, you know, and, and the, you know, there, there have been five times, and it's been for different reasons, one or two have been because of lift, ass lift assistance. And, you know, that was just my point. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming before us. Thank you. And please have that conversation. <laughs> All right. With that, um, we'll move on with the agenda. Mr. Uh, Chair, I'll move to consent calendar. Thank you. Uh, it's been Second. Moved, moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? Madam Clerk, please call the question. Director Mitchell? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Wood? Aye. Barnes? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Scheidegger? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Presentation items? Chief Wells? You know, I'm going to move over to my perch over there. Well, good evening, directors. Um, again, Mark Wells, Fire Chief. Um, tonight, it's uh, our privilege and honor. Um, I would like to invite uh, President of the Board Scheidegger to join me over here, if you would. I'd like to make a presentation on behalf of our appreciation for five years of service on this board. Um, and I'll try to stand this way. I don't like my back to the audience. But, you know, Director Scheidegger has um, come to us uh, five years ago. He came after a, a very long-standing board member, Tom Lawson, um, departed from us unexpectedly. Um, fantastic board member. And of course, in that process, we went out and had um, a, a process of an appointment to this board um, where Jack Scheidegger um, came to us. Long-term professional background in uh, the criminal justice world, um, extensive background in budgets and in uh, management and in um, items of integrity uh, in, the, in the world of the criminal justice system, um, educated, um, Tremendous board member for the Sacramento Fire or Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. So tonight, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to present with you this five-year um, pen. You were elected in 2012 and uh, through this year, and uh, be up uh, again for a long four-year term. I'm hoping. So um, fantastic job, and I'd like for you to, of course, put you on the spot for a few words. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Just a few words. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you very much for those words, except for the excessive statement of the long term, because it really reflects the age. You know, it's funny. I, I was talking to my 10-year-old uh, grandson this weekend about, of course, sports. And uh, he was talking about uh, uh, athletes and how much money they make. And then he suddenly segued into, well, Grandpa, you're, you're on the fire board. You probably make the same amount of money, don't you? And uh, it, it, there's no similarity, obviously. But uh, so I had to quickly backpedal and explain to him that there's a different kind of reward, a different kind of reward that all of us share. Um, and it's the reward of, of being able to work with the fine people of Metro. Uh, and, and really, it's a chance for us to give back. It's a chance for us to be honored and privileged to serve you. Uh, first of all, the men and women on the line who put their lives on the line every day and do the wonderful job of protecting the community um, are, are just the best in the world. Secondly, the command staff uh, represented in this room is just the finest command staff that I've ever worked with. Uh, you ladies and, and gentlemen are, are just absolutely the best. And finally, my fellow board members, um, the dedication the, uh, the perseverance, the hard work uh, that, that you bring and the vision that you bring to this organization. Uh, it, it's just an honor for me to work with all of you and all of you. Thank you, Chief, very much. Appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you. 
apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, board clerk, would you check, has it really only been five years that he's been here? I checked, yes, You're five years. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I, I truly am honored. Let's move on to the action items. Uh, first of all, Ms. Castleberry, a grant, love to hear it. Good evening, Fire Chief, Directors. I'm Erin Castleberry, uh, the Administrative Specialist in the Economic Development Division. And I'm extremely pleased to be here tonight to let you know that Metro Fire has been awarded grant funding in, uh, from FEMA under the Fiscal Year 2015 Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program. The grant funding has been received to purchase automated chest compression devices to outfit each and every one of Metro Fire's frontline medics. We're extremely excited about this award. Um, the devices will reduce interruptions in CPR and improve efficiency in compressions, thereby leading to better patient outcomes. We're also excited because these devices will help to reduce firefighter fatigue and help them to better focus on other life-saving patient measures like defibrillation, medication, and ventilation. The, um, these devices will truly be a regional asset as well as Metro Fire will be the first agency in our region to outfit all of our frontline medics. So the grant award is made up of federal funding in the amount of $370,228 with a 9% district match from the general fund of $37,022. These figures have been added to the fiscal year 2016-17 preliminary budget, which will be reviewed tonight. And staff is recommending that the board adopt the resolution to, to accept this grant award. And I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Board members, questions? Congratulations, Castleberry. Well done. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, President Shire, um, and if I just may, uh, these, both Aaron and Marie Bernal, Aaron Casper, Marie Bernal in the grants division, unbelievable work. Um, and the grants that we've been able to achieve over time, um, really the, in the weeds where the, um, the rubber meets the road is the grant applications and the quality of those. And they do a fantastic job. And so I just wanted to say thank you also for your hard work. Marie, did you stand up? <laughs> Thank you all very much. This is just fantastic for this community. Questions, comments, uh, motions? Just one thing. Yes. I, I wanted to take a moment just to express my appreciation for the work that you have all put into this. This is, as you know, an important project, uh, and it's an important project personally to me. Um, so thank you again. I know how hard it is to do this stuff, and it makes a real difference. And now that we have these, as the chief refers to them as thumper devices, um, I'm sure, chief, there's another technical name that you might want to brush up on. But do we have a sense of what the protocol is going to be for the distribution of the thumpers? I believe that the EMS division will um, look at operationally where the best place to put them is. Um, we will be getting enough to outfit all of our frontline medics. So um, the EMS and the ops division will take a look at that and figure out operationally where the best place is. And am I correct? Is Metro not going to be the first agency to have one in every uh, unit or available just about every unit? That is correct. That's, that's just fantastic. The community just really benefits from this. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. And, and District 3 volunteers to have the one near my house. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We'll make a note of that, Director. <laughs> Thank you. And on the second note, uh, uh, Mr. President, I move staff's recommendation. Thank you. Also moved and seconded. Call for the question, please. The vote. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Fiscal year preliminary budget. CFO Thomas, good evening. Well, good evening. I, let me kick this thing off a little bit in our... Um, Please, Chief. Of course, I, um, I'm going to be very brief because Amanda's got a, a very full, thorough presentation. 
I wanted to make sure that the board understands that um, obviously our goals are to restore and optimize all the services that we provide um, to the greatest extent possible based on budgetary um, pressures and, uh, and limitations, of course, so that we can ensure that the ongoing all risk fire, rescue, and emergency medical needs of the district are met and provide adequate reserves for future contingencies. So with that, uh, it's interesting to note that the property tax revenues in this next projected year are actually um, expected to return to the pre-recession peak of uh, 2007 and 2008. So we've, we've entered that dip and now we're back to the, right before the pre-recession um, impact on property taxes. And so of course, um, we're, we're excited to be able to say that in this year's uh, preliminary budget, it reflects the reopening of our engine 106 um, over on Butano. Um, it has been closed since August 1st of 2011 on a full-time basis. And so we're gonna be opening that up in this pre in preliminary budget. Um, this budget also um, reflects increases in spending on some labor cost escalations as um, we're represented in our uh, negotiating our TA with our partners in labor. Also some required capital replacements and other equipment needs that need to be replaced. Uh, so this uh, d overall proposed budget does have a very slight deficit of approximately $300,000 that um, Ms. Thomas will go through in the, in the process. Um, but as in the past, uh, management will continue to work very collaboratively with the board, with our partners in labor to aggressively seek out new revenue opportunities, um, new efficiencies in how we deliver our business currently, and other cost-saving opportunities as they come up. So um, anyway, look forward to a good presentation here because uh, finally, um, one thing I'd like to say about this budget, we're not out of the woods, we're really not, but we are definitely in a position where we are making some meaningful gains. Uh, we are still having to forego some things that we know that we should in equipment purchases and things that we would like to be able to do and we're basing those on priorities. But definitely um, coming back and having Engine 106 opened up is a, a big accomplishment. So with that, I'll turn it over to CFO Thomas. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, directors, Chief Wells. Um, I'm here tonight to present the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2016-17. In addition to that, uh, towards the end of the presentation, we'll be talking about some, some very preliminary projections for fiscal year 17-18, which we're not recommending be adopted as a budget, but sort of give us a bit of a, a glimpse into the future. Um, I, I did want to mention that um, the preliminary budget was presented to the Finance and Audit Committee on May 25th. Um, there have been some changes since that presentation that actually have resulted in a reduction to the deficit, so overall an improvement in the numbers um, that we are, we're looking at. So as uh, Chief Wells mentioned, what we're looking at in terms of uh, property tax revenues projected for fiscal 16-17 um, is really a return to the pre-recession peak um, that we received in 2007-8. So you can see total property tax revenues of approximately 129 million at the, you know, the left-hand side of this chart and then looking in the, the fiscal 16-17 column. Um, so it's, it's taken that number of years really to recover back to where we were before the recession. I think the, the, um, the good news side to this chart, though, is, is looking not, not just at the dark blue portion, but the light blue portion. So our other revenues, you can see over that same period of time, we've really experienced a growth in other revenue sources so that we're now relying less on property tax revenues as a funding source than we were in 2007-8. So back at the, the beginning here in 2007-8, um, property tax revenues represented about 80% of total revenues, um, and we're at about 70% uh, when you get to the, the right-hand side of this chart. And really where that revenue diversification has come from, for the most part, is in our medic cost recovery. Um, so looking at this, this chart, you can see that over that same period of time, you know, we're now we're at uh, property tax revenues equal to where, what we had in 2007-8. Our call volume has actually increased 24% over that period of time. 
Um, and most of that increase in calls has come from EMS calls. So it's, um, it's kind of in line with the story of that's where the revenue diversification has come from, that we've, we've been able to um, uh, not only see an increase in that activity, but also ensure um, a, a better result in terms of cost recovery for those services that we're, we're seeing in terms of increased revenues. So turning um, to the actual preliminary budget that's being uh, proposed for adoption this evening, um, what this chart is showing you is essentially all of the funds um, that we're uh, that you would be adopting a budget for. Um, the, the first thing that I wanted to point out is a change that we're making this year. For fiscal year 16, 17, we're introducing a new fund, which is the IGT fund. IGT stands for Intergovernmental Transfer. And this is the um, essentially uh, supplemental reimbursement program for Medi-Cal managed care um, beneficiaries and the transports that are provided to them. Uh, previous to fiscal year 16-17, so in the current year 15-16, and then also in last year 14-15, which was the first year that we participated in the IGT program, this activity was all budgeted for in the general fund. Um, but really, in an effort to provide greater transparency of the, the transactions that are involved here, and also to uh, to uh, make make it easier to isolate that activity, which as we've experienced, can be somewhat volatile from the, isolate that from the general fund. Um, we're budgeting for it in a separate fund beginning in fiscal year 16-17. So you can see in 16-17, um, we are projecting total IGT revenue of about $15 million. However, in order to receive that revenue, we must first transfer out about $9 million. Um, that, that money goes to the state. It allows the state to get a federal matching share. So that net at the end of the day, you can see that roughly $5.9 million um, that we're receiving in net IGT revenue. So this is, this is budgeting for all of that activity here in the IGT fund. And then we're showing, and I'll get into more detail on this later, we're showing that as a transfer that goes into the general fund to offset general fund expenditures. Uh, the rest of the presentation really is going to focus primarily on the general fund, which is the column all the way on the left here. I'll also talk about the capital facilities fund, the lease properties fund, and the grants fund. Um, and I, I won't address um, the development impact fees fund, um, which is really the use of, of that revenue source is really restricted to um, expenditures to mitigate the impact of new development. So building new fire stations, equipping new fire stations. We're not planning for any of that activity in 1617. So turning to the general fund, um, I'll draw your attention to the, the middle column on this chart, which presents the proposed preliminary budget for 1617. You can see that we're budgeting for total general fund revenue of $177 million, um, with total general fund expenses of approximately $179 million uh, for revenues, less expenses of a negative $1.7 million. Then we have transfers in and out of the general fund. Um, the most significant of those are transfer out to the capital facilities fund of roughly 4.4 million. That's required to fund the capital expenditures in the capital facilities fund. Um, and then uh, you'll see that large transfer coming in from the IGT fund of about $5.9 million. So for total net transfers of just under $1.5 million and a total net deficit in the general fund of uh, under just under $300,000. That net deficit, that $300,000, would be funded with the use of reserves of that equivalent amount. We're projecting um, that, that based on our projected ending reserve ratio in 15-16 of 11.6%, and then this um, little under $300,000 use in reserves in 16-17, that we would end fiscal 16-17 with an 11.1% reserve ratio. So looking at those total general fund revenues of 
$177 million. This chart is showing us how that breaks out on a percentage basis. Um, so as we talked about, property taxes obviously make up the, the largest share of that, about 72.9% of general fund revenue. Um, I did, did want to emphasize that when we look at this, we really are just looking at the general fund revenue. So IGT is completely separate from this, not included in this total or these percentages. Um, the second largest revenue source is medic cost recovery. So that's really, that's actually a combination of the actual ambulance billings as well as um, our participation in the GEMT program, um, which is a, a bit of a different mechanism. Um, and that accounts for 20.3% uh, roughly of general fund revenue. And then we have smaller percentages coming from other revenue sources. So, that $177 million general fund revenue budget for 1617 represents a $1.7 million increase in revenues compared to the current budget for fiscal year 1516. Um, and again, that excludes IGT, just looking at general fund and pulling the IGT out of um, the general fund revenues for 1516, even though that's in fact where we've budgeted them this year. But to do an apples to apples comparison, we've, we've taken that out um, to, to calculate this difference. Uh, property tax revenues are a $4.7 million increase, 1617 compared to 1516. That, that's about a 3.8% increase. Um, I did mention that GEMT, we have not only the, the GEMT reimbursement that we would get, that we would normally get for the 1516 activity in 1617, but we also are budgeting for 1.2 million in one-time revenue for prior year GEMT reimbursements that have yet to be received. Um, you'll remember that we, we did budget for that revenue um, in this current year's budget um, and then ended up removing that as a mid-year adjustment because it did not appear that we would be receiving it this year in 15-16. Um, so we're, we're including it in 16-17. Obviously, we'll continue to monitor that as we progress through the year um, to determine whether or not it indeed would be received in 16-17. Um, other changes compared to 1516, uh, we have a $1.3 million decrease in external financing sources. This is because we had $1.3 million of financing for the P25 radio purchase in 1516. We, you know, we obviously don't have that same program in 1617. We don't have the revenue. We also don't have the expense. So there's an offsetting impact on the expense side here. And then similarly for deployment reimbursements, um, we have a $3.3 million decrease compared to 1516. Um, what we have traditionally done in the past does not include any deployment revenue in, um, in the preliminary budget um, or the final budget until we know what the actual activity is for the year. We've taken a slightly different approach this year and have said, we know that as a result of the administrative rate that we charge and some of the equipment reimbursements, that there's some amount of revenue that we can expect to get above the deployment labor expense that will get added in at a later date. So we've looked at, you know, over the last several years, what's the minimum amount that we could expect? That's been included, but we haven't included the amount that would be offset by labor expenses. So we don't have the reimbursement revenue, and we also don't have the offsetting labor expense. So similar to the financing sources, we, we have that taken out on both sides of the, the equation. And then, although not included in the general fund, I think it's important to consider the, the net IGT revenue. As I mentioned, that's a transfer in to the general fund, and that's accounting for about $5.9 million. If we compare that to the, IG, the net IGT revenue that was included in the general fund in this current year, 1516, it represents about a $2.6 million increase. So the net increase after adjusting for the items that have some offsetting impacts, so the financing and the deployment, and then also adding in the IGT, is at about an $8.9 million in additional funding available compared to 1516. So turning to look at expenses, we have a, a total expenditure budget for, for excuse me for 1617 of about 179 million dollars, and this chart is showing how that breaks down in terms of percentages. Um, obviously, the the largest component of that is our labor budget at about 86.4 percent, 11.8 percent for services and supplies, and then finally 1.8 percent for 
the third category of expenses, which is taxes, licenses, assessments, contributions. So looking at the general fund labor budget for fiscal year 1617, we have a $155 million labor budget, which is up $2.3 million compared to the mid-year budget for fiscal year 1516. Um, however, if we adjust for deployment expenses, so as I mentioned, the mid-year budget includes labor expenses for deployments in 1516 in that we are not yet reflecting in 1617 because those amounts aren't known. So if we take those expenses out of 1516 and do the comparison, again, so it's a more apples to apples comparison, the net increase in labor costs is $4.8 million. So some of the, the changes from 1516 um, include, obviously, implementation of the new labor agreement terms. So we have salary increases um, for uh, pension. We have the elimination of employer paid member contributions, um, as well as the restoration of cost sharing on pensions. So that's a, a, a change relative to the 1516 mid-year budget. Um, adjustments to longevity and education incentives, um, as well as adjustment to the definition of hours worked for calculating overtime pay. So all of those things are contributing to changes. Um, we also have increases in medical and pension rates. So for example, um, our uh, CalPERS safety rate has increased from 38% in 1516 to 42% in 1617. Um, we have an increase of about $900,000 um, due to required payments to SCRS as we work towards addressing that unfunded liability. Um, and then we also have increases in medical rates of uh, approximately 10.5% for calendar year 2016, and then we're projecting about 7.5% for calendar year 2017. Um, as Chief Wells mentioned, this, this budget assumes the staffing of Engine 106 effective July 1st, 2016, so that's reflected in the labor budget. Um, we also have additional filled positions and new position requests relative to 1516. And then finally, as a result of having additional filled positions, um, we're seeing our constant staffing overtime budget has reduced significantly. So we have about a quarter reduction compared to 1516. Uh, that's about two and a half million dollars. And that's um, even with having an additional engine company um, operating in 1617 compared to 1516. So we're still seeing that overall reduction in overtime. And finally, um, although this isn't really contributing to a change because the, the, the number ends up being the same, um, this budget is assuming that the, our other post-employment benefits or retiree medical um, contributions um, that were pre-funding for the explicit subsidy liability only, so that's consistent um, with how this has been done historically, that the implicit subsidy liability um, would be paid on a pay-as-you-go basis. Essentially, we see that cost reflected in the active employee premiums, but we would not be contributing additional amounts to the trust to fund that. So that results in our, our OPEB arc um, remaining relatively constant from 1516 to 1617. Turning to services and supplies expenses, total services and supplies budget in the general fund is $21.2 million. This is, ac or excuse me, yes, this is actually a $1.1 million reduction compared to 1516. Um, but again, that's excluding IGT, so we're taking IGT expenses that were budgeted in 1516 out of that number to, to do this comparison. Uh, we've, we see a $2 million decrease related to one-time expenditures that occurred in 1516. Um, those were primarily for the, the radios that I mentioned. Um, we also had helicopter upgrade and, and uh, a CAD computer-aided dispatch, dispatch purchase that were in 1516 we don't have in 1617. And then that decrease um, was offset somewhat by expenses for um, election services, software, vehicle maintenance, and various other expenses. Our, our final general fund expenditure category is debt service assessments and contributions. That budget totals $3.3 million. Um, the largest component of that is $1.8 million, $1.8 million assessment that's paid to the county for their administration and collection of property taxes on our behalf. Um, but this is also where we budget for the general fund debt service payments. Those total $1.1 million. Um, and you can see how that breaks out um, listed here. So 
So finally, in addition to the revenues and expenses in the general fund, um, there are transfers in and out of the general fund, some of which I've already discussed. Um, the net transfers are $1.5 million. So that includes the $4.4 million transfer to the capital facilities fund that's needed to fund the capital expenditures. Um, that's a $1.6 million increase compared to um, the current year budget in 1516. There's also a, a $5.9 million transfer that I've mentioned that's coming in from the IGT fund. So that's, that's um, increasing the funding available in the general fund. There's a $40,000 transfer, approximately transfer out to the grants fund, and that's our local match um, for the grants. So it's a non-federal portion of the grants. And then finally, there's a $40, excuse me, $40,000 transfer in from the deferred compensation reserves that is offsetting deferred compensation expenses in the budget. So turning from the general fund to the capital facilities fund, this chart is showing the uh, 15, or 16, 17 budget for the capital facilities fund. Um, you can see looking at the middle column that total revenue for this fund is budgeted at $6 million um, with total expenses of um, almost 10 and a half million. Um, so for uh, revenues minus expenditures, number of a negative $4.4 million, and then that um, being met with a transfer coming in from the general fund to fund that need. So that net funding requirement of $4.4 million from the general fund is the result of $6.9 million of capital outlay expenses, which are offset by $6.1 million of financing proceeds. So we're assuming that $6.1 million of the expenditures will be financed. Overall, there's a $3.5 million debt service requirement. $1.3 million of that is related to items that would be purchased in 1617. So, uh, in, in those $6.1 million of financed assets, we're, we're getting a $1.3 million debt service requirement. With the remaining $2.2 million in debt service, um, the result of prior year debt. Some of the major capital purchases that are making up the $6.9 million, .9 million capital outlay budget are um, a station alerting upgrade for $2 million, um, six ambulances and associated equipment for $1.3 million, mobile data computers for a million, uh, two Type 5 wildland engines and equipment for half a million, and a water tender and equipment for half a million. Turning to the grant fund, um, the budget for the grant fund includes the grant that was uh, approved this evening for the automatic chest compression devices, um, as well as um, smaller amounts associated with the completion of the current um, residential care facility inspection grant. Um, you can see overall we're looking at total revenue of a little over 400,000, total ex expenditures of about 450,000, and then we have that, that net requirement of the local funding match of um, just under $40,000 coming from the general fund. The leased properties fund is where we account for the revenues and expenses associated with the district's leased properties. Um, looking at the middle column here, which represents the recommended budget for 1617, you can see that we're projecting total revenue of about 700,000, total expenses um, of about 800,000 with a $100,000 deficit. Um, that's resulting from the fact that we have a lease that's expiring at the end of this calendar year, or at least with Sutter. Um, so we're anticipating, based on the advice of our broker, that, that we should expect a, uh, at least a six-month period um, without rental income. So that's what's built into this budget as an assumption. Um, that's generating this $100,000 deficit. However, the deficit can be funded with available reserves in the leased properties fund. So there is no impact to the general fund as a result of this. Yes, Director Orozelli. Um, we're projecting the potential for six months. Any estimate of how long it might be before it would have an impact? Oh, in terms of what the, what the available reserves are in the lease properties fund? Yes, so um, 
So we're, we're projecting that as of the end of this fiscal year, we'd have about an $800,000 reserve in the lease properties fund. So if, if we had a $100,000 deficit next fiscal year, the end of next fiscal year would be about a $700,000 deficit. Um, so we're, we would be able to absorb some, some additional months beyond okay, this that's, year. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Correct. So this is the reserve in the leased properties fund, not the general fund. Mm -hmm. So that, that actually wrapped up the discussion of the 16-17 um, preliminary budget. Shifting beyond 16-17, um, you might remember when I was here talking about mid-year budget for this year, I think the last slide, I, I sort of identified some of the, the future impacts we may be seeing, things that weren't reflected in the 15-16 budget but would be reflected um, in future years. And several of those you know, have been addressed and are reflected in 16-17, um, but many are not, particularly in terms of our, our capital and vehicle replacement needs. And if we create a hypothetical scenario where we say we're going to assume that all of that gets funded in fiscal year 17-18, then, then that essentially produces these results. And what I've shown here are the general fund and then, and then the two funds that really have an impact on the general fund, which are the capital facilities fund and the IGT fund. So for example, if you look in the capital facilities fund, um, which is the middle column at the capital outlay, you can see that funding everything that's been identified as we should have replaced it would require um, almost $26 million in capital outlay. Um, that obviously drives um, the, the required $10 million transfer in from the general fund, um, which contributes to, again, an almost $10 million deficit that's being shown here in the general fund. So you can see you know, where the, the impact of all of that is. Um, so that, that preliminary outlook for 17-18 really is capturing the capital deferrals from 16-17, so things that could not be accommodated in the 16-17 budget, um, shifting them out to 17-18. Um, and the, as I mentioned, that's about a, a $26 million um, capital expense requirement, which would result in $5.3 million in additional debt service if all of that were to be financed. Um, the other thing that you're seeing when we look at 1718 are that our expected labor costs increase. So not only as a result of um, uh, salary increases that are known now, but also assumptions that we would make about future pension and medical cost increases. And then finally, um, we've identified, or excuse me, the budget officers have all identified um, other planned expenditures that they would expect to have in fiscal 1718. The revenue projections for 1718 include a 4.3% increase in property tax revenue. Um, that's, that equates to about $6 million, and that 4.3% is a projection that's been provided by our property tax consultant. Um, obviously, the 1718 projections will be refined as more information regarding the revenues and expenses becomes available. Um, the projection isn't meant to be a budget. I'm, you know, we're not asking that it be adopted this evening, um, and it's something that we'll continue to explore um, with additional revenue opportunities and cost efficiencies, and really as we get closer to the time when we would be adopting a budget for 1718, we would go through the same process that we do every year where we really better align our revenues and expenses. So with that, um, the recommendation is to adopt the preliminary budget for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2017, and I'd be happy to take any additional questions. I believe. Mr. Chair, I'll move yes. that we adopt uh, Resolution 2016-17 Preliminary Budget for the General Operating Fund 212A. Thank you. I second. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Board Clerk, call for the vote, please. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. There is a Mr. Chair, I'll move that we adopt uh, Resolution 2016-17 Preliminary Budget for the Capital Facilities Fund 212-D. Second. Thank you, Directors. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. 
Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Is there a motion on item C? Mr. Chair, I'll move that uh, we adopt a resolution 2016-17 preliminary budget for the grants fund 212G. Second. Thank you. Vote. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Concerning item 2D. Mr. Chair, I'll move we adopt resolution 2016-17 preliminary budget for the development impact fees fund 212I. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If it pleases the group, I would move Resolution E, the 2016-2017 Preliminary Budget for the Leased Properties Fund 212L. Thank you, Director. I'll second. Thank you. Call for the vote. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If it pleases the group, I would move Resolution F, the 2016-2017 preliminary budget for the IGT fund, 212M. I'll Thank second. You, Thank you, Director. Call for the vote. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, and actually if I could, I would, I would actually like to thank others because I'm really not the one who does most of the work. Um, so I, I'd like to thank all of the budget officers for their time, effort, energy put into the process. I mean, it is quite a process that we go through internally and we couldn't do it without um, the input of everyone involved. Um, I'd like to in particular thank Chief Bridge who helped lead um, our internal meetings, Chief Taylor for his red pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, um, the staff and finance. You know, I'm the one who stands up here and gets all the credit, but they're the ones who do all the work. Um, so in particular, I'd like to thank Tara Mailer, Sarah Ortiz, and Ron and Padrad, our controller. So, thank you. Thank you and your staff. I had the good fortune to witness a little bit Let's move on to disclosure of material expenditures, excess workers' compensation. Chief Holbrook. Directors, Chief Wells, good evening. My name is Chris Holbrook, Deputy Chief of Administration. Tonight before you, item three and four are both disclosure of material uh, expenditures uh, for insurance products. The district, as you uh, may recall, every June, in anticipation of the next budget year, renews all of our insurance policies. Those policies, most of them do not exceed a spending threshold of $100,000, so they wind up on, cons on consent, as happened tonight. Two of those um, particular policies far exceed the $100,000 threshold, thus they are brought before you. So I'm not going to even pretend to be an expert in this, so um, we have our insurance broker. This is Mr. Brad Spenningson. He is a senior vice president with Wells Fargo Insurance and uh, has served this district many years, as a matter of fact, um, been before this board many times. So he is going to speak to items three and four and uh, answer any particular questions. We'll address them individually as action items. So, Brad. Thank you. Hi, Brad Spenningson, Wells Fargo Insurance. Thanks for having me. Just a little overview. We had seven uh, policies or uh, items that were up for renewal. And uh, I see my goal as the broker to go out to the marketplace and get the best coverage at the best price. And if I can somehow come in with a no increase or a decrease in premium, it makes my life a lot easier. So. Fortunately, we're in that situation. Uh, of the seven items, uh, four had no change in premium, three went down, and one policy went up by $503. Uh, 
The first item um, is the excess workers' comp, and uh, that uh, we were able to get that to a 5.7% rate decrease uh, over last year with the same carrier that you're with right now. And I'm not sure if you want to discuss anything more than that. Ever take this opportunity to uh, move staff's recommendation and uh, authorize the payment not to exceed $452,466 to Safety National for excess workers' compensation insurance? That would be item three. I believe it is. Yes, thank you. Any seconds, Dr. Mitchell? Aye. Orzali? Aye. Wood? Aye. Barnes? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Jones? Aye. And Scheidegger? Motion passes. Oh, I don't have to. Yeah. Did we have a motion? If there are no Mr. questions. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I will move approval of item four. Uh, item four is a uh, payment of $425,156 and 35 cents to the Special District Risk Management Authority for Commercial Insurance. Thank you, Director. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Call for the vote. Director Mitchell. Aye. Orzali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. And Scheidegger. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Job well done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. In a related area uh, I, that I'm associated with, uh, I see workers' comp expenses going up. Um, so I think that's a, a real credit to our efforts for the district. Thank you. All right, let's go to reports. Uh, President's report. Uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody understands the fire chief application uh, period has closed. I believe we have 25 applicants, uh, which is exciting. That's all I know. Moving on, uh, Chief Wells. Well, good evening again, directors. Um, so I just wanted to bring the board into, uh, we're, we're in a negotiation phase, uh, and I don't want to speak too much about the negotiation aspect, but it's on the Aspen One property, on which is in South Watt at Jackson Road. It's an annexation by the city of Sacramento. It's kind of been going on for a while. Um, however, on the 2nd of June, myself, um, Amanda Thomas and um, Chief Bridge, we met with the county and the city, and um, which was a very good positive meeting and had some meaningful discussions. So we're hoping to, in the near term, whatever, uh, in the next number of weeks to months, um, come up with some sort of a tax sharing agreement um, that adequately represents um, an area of service for us that we will continue to service regardless of any annexation. Um, the beauty of the fire service and the way we do it here in Sacramento County is it's an automatic um, response based on who's the closer unit. So regardless, uh, unlike it might be in a, in a different type of park district or something where you might have to drive further to provide the resources from across town and you'd still service that property if you owned it, in the fire department, whoever's closest responds. And so we're looking forward to a very meaningful um, negotiation with that, and um, so far so good, and uh, we are planning to meet in the near term with our partners. Um, we also have an academy start date for the single role paramedic, 16-2. That's going to start on Monday. Um, we have on the 30th of June another town hall meeting, um, and the board of directors will be getting that. Um, specifics, if you'd like to attend, it's a good opportunity for the command staff and the uh, managers to sit down in front of our um, the folks that um, we're all working with to talk about real questions, get real answers, and uh, especially in this budget period, it's a good time to go over what the final proposed budget is, opening of fire stations, those types of things. So that's happening on the 30th of June. I'd like to um, tonight really acknowledge. I believe it's in this room. In the boardroom, yes. Yeah, we've rotated it around over time because I wanted it to be more participative in different areas, but we came into, uh, we have very good acoustics and sound systems here that we can make a good product that we can broadcast that we like to do it here. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, Tonight, I'd like to uh, specifically acknowledge on the 26th of May, Captain Brad Desert retired, 22 years of service. I worked a long time with Brad. 
And on the 29th of May, our own Assistant Chief Pat Ellis retired at 28 years of service. So I'd like to wish them well into their retirement. Um, new hires, on the 24th of May, we had Amy Peterson as an office technician assigned to the Fleet Division up there at McClellan. Um, on the 1st of June, we have Santiago Naranjo, who has been hired into the community uh, computer systems technician position. Uh, recruitment, um, one I'd like to just say congratulations. We had 13 fire captains who were successful in the battalion chief exam process. Um, it's actually a very, and I'd like to also thank the, um, the training division and the, uh, all the assessors that come from other places to help us um, you know, evaluate our personnel and uh, the human resources division. It's a huge lift and a very good process. Um, they are always good processes, but this time in particular, uh, a, great, um, a great process, and I'm very excited about the 13 captains who were successful. Also, the logistics technician, we have a final filing date of the 10th of June, would be tomorrow at 4 p.m. Also tomorrow at 4 p.m. is the final filing date for a facilities manager position. Um, we have a pending um, retirement of our Steve Borglund, which we'll announce at another meeting, but he'll be retiring soon. So recruiting for that. And we have a plan intake specialist position with a final filing date of the 14th of June at 4 p.m. So then I'd like to just carry over a couple more things here. Um, I'd like to thank on the 20th of May, um, of course, uh, down at Discovery Park, uh, Michelle, Captain Item was down um, with our boat crews were out there doing some water things, water rescue, water safety, um, doing a participation on a Life Looks Good on You and Kids Don't Float public awareness campaign on life jacket safety on the river. I can't overestimate or overemphasize every year the drownings that happen in this region, and we talk about it every year, and I'd really, and, and from the dais here, hopefully somebody will hear it, you have to wear a life jacket, and if you're a child and you're 13 years of age or younger, it's illegal not to have one on. And so parents need to be very cognizant of that. There's a lot of life jackets available posted up and down the river in these programs. And so I really want people to think water safety this year. So that, that happened on the 20th. Um, last Saturday was the Antelope Summer Fest, um, and that was out at Antelope Community Park. Um, of course, we had our sidewalk CPR program going where we um, taught about 120 people. I'd like to specifically thank Zach Cornell, who is actually a single role paramedic for Metro Fire, does a fantastic job administering that program. And of course, our um, reserves from the Rio Linda area, every time, every place you see, they step up, and I really want to thank them for their participation of that event. And last, I'd like to just um, acknowledge, this is kind of happening in real time, and it's still uh, as of this morning, but I'd like to specifically acknowledge, we had a, an issue where um, Metro Fire has had over 54 animal rescues so far this calendar year. We, we really do go out there and, and try to impact our community in a lot of different ways. And, and some of those are our, for our, our animal friends out there. So of course, there's a, a cat named Bunny, and you can't make that up. Uh, so there's a cat named Bunny that unfortunately was um, in a up a tree, and you hear about that all the time. Fire departments, you know, are going to respond for a cat in a tree. Well, the reality of that, uh, yeah, the reality of that is, you know, there's a, a risk-benefit relationship there, and there's also the high, strong probability that oftentimes um, animals self-extricate from those situations. This particular case, that, that it, it did not happen that way. And so I'd like to specifically acknowledge um, Truck 106's crew went out there with Captain Graf and his crew on one day and, and assessed the situation. It was 100 plus temperatures for a long time. And believe me, this, um, the cat named Bunny was up the tree for longer than a week. Um, in and out, and it was kind of an unusual circumstance, very difficult to get to, a neighbor's property, uh, and they weren't really sure if it was coming and going. Um, and so anyway, so it was a kind of a long process. So. Sure enough, uh, eventually uh, Michelle Item, our uh, Captain Item, our PIO, is involved, as long as our Operations Division, Chief Bridge and his group. Um, Battalion Chief Castros, who you heard tonight, you know, is always a, a very good representative of Metro Fire when he's out there. Um, went out there on the scene, kind of stabilized the situation with the property owners, the pet owner, et cetera. And eventually, um, as of last night, up until the wee hours of the evening, literally, um, our rescue company, Rescue 21, and I'd like to specifically acknowledge Captain Sloan, Engineer Von Chance Stutler, 
Firefighter Watts and Firefighter Katsuyoshi. Um, these guys have equipment and training and, and technical expertise that is uh, literally designed for very complicated rescue scenarios. They're up the middle of a, an old oak tree using search cameras that are designed to find people in rubble based on earthquakes and in confined spaces. And um, made positive contact with Bunny the cat, uh, but was very resilient and would not come out. Um, and so they literally fed, um, provided food, were involved with the group. Um, animal control was out there and a lot of different experts on this thing. Eventually placed a ladder to the tree um, because you know the, the cat, like firefighters, will climb down the ladder uh, eventually. And so it's to our knowledge today, based on this morning's um, further diagnosis of continued um, over and above professional support for this rescue company and Chief Castro's. They're out there, and um, today the cat is not in the tree. He is, um, we were hoping, at home. And, um, but I'd just like to call out, and I know it's one of those things, everyone jokes about the fire department, and we are a fire department, and it's an interesting thing, but we make things better. Whatever's bad, we go out there and we touch it and we try to make it better. And in this particular case for Bunny, um, the cat. Um, we believe and we'd like to have um, that it's been rescued, but the amount of effort and professional compassion, I think is the best word, of continued resilience in this effort um, to manage kind of an interesting situation, multiple property lines, and to use technology, because people would argue, okay, well, is that a good investment of public funds to have people out there? And you know what? One, it's a life, and two, it's absolutely good training. They're doing a lead climbing expedition in a tree that they would use on a radio tower if they needed to rescue somebody that was stranded on that, exercising equipment that they would need on a different type of disaster. So all in all, I couldn't be more proud of this agency, the people that step up every day, uh, and that's just one case and a good outcome that I'd like to acknowledge. So strong work, everybody, and um, keep up the good work. <laughs> End of my report. Thank you, Chief. We're particularly glad to hear about Bunny. Uh, Chief Bridge, operations. President Scheidegger, directors, Chief Wells, I'm Merrick Bridge, Deputy Chief Operations, and a brief report for you for the numbers, and they're very similar as they have been throughout the year. Since the last board meeting, we've had just under 4,000 dispatched for services, of which 3,000 of those were EMS related. Uh, continued with our transport ratio of about 72% of transporting 2,100 plus patients. We've had also a total of 21 structure fires since the last board meeting on May 26th. And that concludes my numbers for tonight. Thank you, Chief. Any questions of the Chief in operations? All right. Thank you. Is anyone here from 522? All right. Then we'll move into committee and delegate reports. Uh, the executive committee will meet. Council Oliver, did I skip you? Uh, that's okay. I, I did, no. Uh, you, I, pardon I have me. No Council Oliver. I have no report. Thank you. Thank I you. knew that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's go now to committee delegate reports. Uh, executive committee, the executive committee will meet on June 23rd at 4 o'clock right here. Uh, Communication Center, JPA, Chief Bridge. At JPA Comps Board, we met uh, this, uh, May 28th, and we passed the preliminary budget, and our next meeting will be June 28th, right here at that point. Very good. Thank you. California Fire and Rescue Training, JPA, Director Kelly. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the JPA has not met since I last reported out. Uh, we have plans to meet on the 16th, which is uh, next Wednesday. And uh, we will meet here in the uh, uh, California Exercise Simulation Center. Very good. We'll look forward to that. Thank you. Finance Committee, Director Wood. Uh, Finance and Audit Committee has not met since we've uh, last reported out. I understand we are set for a meeting on July 28th at 5 o'clock. I will uh, need to rely on my fellow committee members to attend that as I will not be there. We'll miss you. I know. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Policy Committee, I believe Director Rosali is filling in a admirably. <laughs> Thank you. Policy Committee uh, met this evening, had a very successful uh, uh, meeting, and we will meet again on July 14th at 5 p.m. That'll be on the calendar. 
All right, let's go to board member questions and comments. Director Jones. Uh, thank you, Director Schadiger. Congratulations and a thank you to each and every employee, individual who participated in the budget process. It is long and arduous, and uh, we keep coming up with a pretty good product. So thank you very much. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, one of Metro's leads, uh, continuing from some initial work with Cap to Cap, uh, uh, Assistant Chief Maurice Johnson and Captain Scott Perryman, uh, uh, mm, they were catalysts for an excellent meeting Monday uh, with all of our local health care providers, hospital representatives, for the alternative destination idea. This is an, an incipient stage, just like a little fire, but I think it will grow eventually. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge it is for alternative destinations to help with wall time and uh, more appropriate use of 911 emergency calls, et cetera. And I wanted to acknowledge Chief Johnson, Captain Perryman, and again, all of our provider uh, partners. Uh, thank you for stepping up and participating uh, to help for better outcomes for each and every person in our community. Good comments, thank you. Director Mitchell. Thank you, Board Chairperson. Uh, a special shout out tonight to uh, the people that are responsible for our grants. Uh, these are things that don't come easily, and but a lot of work is put on. So we thank you for the, the uh, extra time and effort for our grant funding. Also a shout out to our people that presented our preliminary budget tonight. Uh, it's an extraordinary amount of work that goes into this. and. Uh, I, I think some of the things we saw tonight that are, are going to help us in the next in the coming years. So we thank you for that. And on a personal note, I would certainly like to thank uh, Board Clerk Melissa Pinella. Uh, she arranged for a class that uh, I needed uh, to sit on this board. So I would thank her personally for arranging for that. So and with that said, uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Kelly. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would like to. Uh, commend you on five years of service it well thank you it's gone by very quickly <laughs> <laughs> and I would also uh, like to thank all the work that uh, went into the budget effort uh, certainly it is a reminder of why I call you guys the high-performing team otherwise known as Metro fire uh, I use that term on a regular basis in social media whenever I am commenting about Metro fire and uh, I believe it with uh, with all my heart uh, what we've seen you guys do from the time, uh, well, from 2007, uh, when the budget was 100 and, what was it, 30 million? Uh, and here we are uh, uh, still performing the wonderful services that we have when the budget was 180 million before that. Uh, I think that, uh, I, th I certainly think that uh, uh, that effort uh, goes to uh, speak of the high level of expertise and commitment by everyone in this district uh, to do their very best. And so, uh, again, thank you again uh, for allowing me to be part of it. Thank you. Good comments. Yes. Director Roselli. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to take a, a moment to once again congratulate the members of the grant team. Uh, I know how much work that is, and um, it's deeply appreciated. I also wanted to thank CFO Thomas for uh, taking the time to carefully and using very small words walk me through the IGT program, which um, as a testimony to her skills, she was able to get me to understand. <laughs> also, directors, in your packet this evening, there is a, um, a memo that um, uh, was sent out. I was contacted by a member of the community, and this gentleman was just expressing to me his perception about our inspections and inspection fees. And the thing that was most salient about it to me was his asking that as we make decisions about things such as um, fees, that we look at and consider the impact that it has on the small business community. That's an important part of this and recognizing that we deal constantly with conflicting priorities, it's easy to lose touch of how does this affect 
our constituents. So there's a memo in there, um, and uh, and I appreciated his taking the time. He asked not to be identified, and uh, but it is always good to hear from the people in the community. Last, and I will only say this once, I want to take a, a moment to uh, express my appreciation and admiration for the service that Jack Scheidegger has brought to this board. <laughs> the five very long years that Jack has been with us have been um, an excellent example of his natural leadership, his ability, and his humanity, and I am honored to work with him. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Director Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to echo all the comments regarding the preliminary budget and the uh, grant funding, you're the unsung heroes that keeps the organization going. You know, a lot of the firefighters and medics get out there in front of the camera and they're seen and people love that. But the reality is, is you all get the funding necessary to keep this agency going. So I appreciate that. To hear about the thumper device, to be um, <clears throat> the first agency in the region for the frontline medics to have that, that again, you, we're trailblazers and we're setting, the, we're setting the standard for the area. So I appreciate that. I enjoy being part of the organization that continues to do this. So great work. Good comments, thank you. Director Wood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll echo the comments that were made before me and I will also add that uh, I wanna thank Mr. Stephen Williams of Carmichael for coming in and bringing in his concerns. Uh, it's, it's very good that people feel comfortable and they should feel comfortable bringing their issues to us to address. So appreciate him taking the time to do that. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you these years. Congratulations on the five. Thank you. And I uh, look forward to uh, hopefully four more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no more salient comments to add. Those already made. Thank you all very much for attending. We're going to close or recess to close session. And with that, I invite you all to go home and be with your families. Thank you very much. Better get mad. Lock me up.